We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, at the beginning of our time of devotion. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks, O Lord, for the privilege we have to assemble together here in the Lord's house this afternoon. We look to thee, dear Lord, for thy great help to be given in our season together. O Lord, we pray that our worship would be accepted of thee. So grant that help, we pray, to worship our Lord's name aright. And may our Lord's name be that which is magnified in the midst of the Lord's people. So we pray all this in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to turn, please, to the hymn number 218. The hymn 218. Uh, these words are based on the latter part of Psalm 24, where it speaks of the lifting up of the gates and the doors, that uh, the Lord might enter in the King of Glory. And it is, of course, pointing forward to our Lord's ascension into glory and taking that seat at the Father's right hand. 218. We're going to try something a little different this evening and we have some music here in the pulpit if i turn it on we can just sing on so sometimes um, their timing is different than mine so if i turn it off we'll just keep uh, singing <laughs>
Seek our Lord's face together, please, again, in prayer. Be the prayer of our hearts that our eyes will be lifted afresh to our Lord Jesus Christ this evening. And we will have that fresh sight of our beautiful Savior. Our gracious Father, we thank thee that it is on the basis of our Savior's finished work that we draw nigh to thee this evening. O oh Lord, we thank thee for that great call that there was. Lift up the gates, lift up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. We thank thee that the King of glory has ascended, he has taken the throne, that he is exalted at the Father's right hand. And, O oh Lord, we thank thee for his appearance in glory this evening, that he appears there, the ever living. He makes intercession for us. O oh Lord, we give thee thanks this evening for the privilege that is ours to come and meet together in thy presence, to sit at thy feet, to hear thy voice. Lord, it is our desire this evening that this time will be as that time when Mary Bethany sat at thy feet. She heard thy voice. In past days, we have been, as Martha, comforted about by much serving. O oh Lord, we pray then this evening that we will be enabled to take the place of Mary to hear the Lord's voice. And yea, Lord, we pray that we will be like Mary in her grasping of truth of God. That is truth dawned upon her soul in a way that it would seem even the disciples had not grasped at that time. Oh Lord, we pray that we will lay hold upon truth this evening. That we will be helped by it. Oh Lord, we desire to live Truly transformed lives. Oh Lord, how it saddens us when in these days we see many that profess the Lord's name and yet their life is a very different testament. Oh Lord, we confess our own sinfulness, our own failing, our own hypocrisies. Cleanse us afresh this evening, we pray. Forgive us of our sin. Enable us to live in a manner that is pleasing unto thy sight. To that end, take the word this evening and write it upon our hearts. Strengthen it. Strengthen us through it, we do pray. Remember those that would love to be here and they cannot, we pray for the sick. The touch of the Lord will be upon them, raise them up to a full measure of health and strength again, we pray. O Lord, we pray for those in the congregation that are going through tough times, times of deep trial. O Lord, we pray that you will draw near to your people and encourage them, we pray, in the things concerning thy sin. So, Lord, we Commend this season to be come and minister to all of your hearts. In the Lord's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the hymn 456. 456 children of the heavenly King, as ye journey, sweetly sing, sing your Saviour's worthy praise, glorious in his words and ways and in these words fit so perfectly really with 
what we want to look at later in the service that we are journeying and with our king he is bringing us safely home to glory the words might not be familiar to us but uh, trust that the children will be <laughs> Solomon 
made himself the chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion. Behold, King Solomon with the crime wherewith his mother crimed him in the day of his espousals, and in the day of the gladness of his heart. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which come up from the washings, whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two young roes that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh, and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinear, and Hermon, from the lion's dance, from the mountains of the Lebanon. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O oh, my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Garden enclosed is my sister. My spouse, spring shove up that garden seat. We'll end our reading there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. We're going to have now the Westminster Confession, or rather the larger catechism. And it's the Question 67. Question 67. The question 66 ended with the words effectual calling, and therefore, question 6 takes up the subject. Sorry, question 67. What is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's almighty power and grace, whereby, out of His free and special love to His elect, and from nothing in them, moving him thereunto, he does, in his accepted time, invite and draw them to Jesus Christ by his word and spirit, seemingly enlightening their minds, renewing and powerfully determining their wills, so as they, although in themselves dead in sins, are hereby made willing and able freely to answer his call, to accept and embrace the grace offered and to convey it therein. And so this effectual calling then has to do with the calling of the Holy Spirit, uh, the effectual calling of the Holy Spirit, drawing the sinner onto salvation. Uh, this doctrine sometimes then referred to as irresistible, calling irresistible grace. In John chapter 5, verse 25, our Lord Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now it is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And there was, of course, a very literal, physical fulfillment of that in 
our Lord's ministry and there were those that heard the voice of God in physical deadness and lived. And Lazarus of course being the great example from the Gospel of John. And there is a future aspect to this that from the dust the Lord will speak and the Lord will call the dead. And yet clearly and the whole context of this chapter, speaking of the quickening, the son quickeneth whom he will, and what is in view is this effectual call that we are speaking about in this answer. The hour is coming now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And so the sinner today is dead in trespasses and sins. The sinner is not born with spiritual life, he is born in deadness. Uh, and there needs them to be this work of the Holy Spirit in him. Uh, and uh, the, the Lord is under no obligation to call any. There are those who will say this doctrine of the Lord calling his elect is unfair. Some will allege injustice. Well, we had what we deserve by justice only outside of Christ we would all hell. so we would all deserve hell but praise God there is this mercy and so the writers here speak of the Lord's free and special love to his elect from nothing in them needing any other right. there's no good in us that would cause the Lord to call us uh, this call then uh, it is a most powerful call where it speaks here of the work of God's almighty power and grace for as the words go on to describe the sinner in the deadness of his sins and yet the Lord is able to, to speak and to effectually draw of course this is so wonderfully pictured for us in the resurrection of Lazarus uh, as the Lord came and spoke to Lazarus Lazarus had no ability in himself to bring himself the Lord gave the call and the Lord gave the will to obey as well as the ability to obey. And so sinners then have a new will as we are given to them and a new ability where they are able to come and they are able to do the very thing that so long they resisted. And so in scripture there are two different calls. There is the outward call of the gospel. And of course, we are to have that in the pulpit as well as in all of our daily witness. We are calling sinners unto Jesus Christ. And that is a call that is resistant. Then there is this effectual call when the Holy Spirit comes and renews the heart, draws the sinner to himself. And this is not to say that the sinner is being forced to do something against his will. When the Lord renews the will, the sinner now comes gladly. He had resisted, but he now comes gladly. He embraces the grace offered. He answers that call. He comes to Christ. And this, of course, gives us great confidence then in evangelism. And we have this confidence that when the Lord works, there will be those that hear voice of the Lord and those that he shall live. We can see that in our work for the Lord in these days. Thank you all for coming to the meeting this evening. It's good to see each one gathered with us and we trust that you will know in the Lord's help as we continue in our time of worship here this evening. There's no man to prepare meeting tomorrow night on account of the public holiday and all of the other meetings are as usual. We will be having the annual general meeting on the 26th of June after the uh, morning meeting. So, 26th of June, there will be the annual general meeting. But uh, I think these are all the necessary announcements. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, and we're turning to the hymn 304. Three hundred four. <clears throat> we 
you're never, never weary of the grand old song, Glory to God. Hallelujah. Remain seated at the beginning as the offering for the Lord of the Lord. Three hundred. journeying alone, that the King is with us, 
And by the Holy Spirit of God, Christ is being ministered to us as we make our journey to glory. Grant thy help then as we meditate over thy word. Give that needed help of the Holy Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Over this weekend, there have been many celebrations concerning the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. While the Queen ascended the throne in 1952, the coronation was not until June, the coronation ceremony was not until June 1953. That ceremony took place in Westminster Abbey and the Queen wore a dress of white satin um, and embroidered with emblems of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in gold and silver thread. She and her husband travelled uh, in the gold state coach and in the a great procession in the Abbey there were 250 including religious, political and military leaders. But all eyes of course were upon the one that was crowned. Now here in Song of Solomon chapter 3 we read of a royal procession. It was en route and I believe to a great royal wedding and it is the royal wedding of King Solomon to the Shulamite woman which is of course the love story of this book of Song of Solomon. And this is a fascinating story. Remember Solomon sadly in his fall had many women and yet it's an act of great mercy that the Spirit of God inspired him to pen the most famous piece of literature on the subject of love, this book of the Song of Solomon. The account of Solomon and his love for his bride is, I believe, a great picture of the love that Christ has for his church. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 is certainly supportive of this view where Paul clearly states there that the union between a husband and wife is a picture of the union between Christ and his church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And the predominant view then among the Puritans concerning the Song of Solomon was that it is describing the great love story between Christ and his church. Now that particular view has uh, sadly fallen upon hard times. And today, uh, even among uh, reformed preachers, uh, that is no longer, I think, the prevalent view, though I think it still is the prevalent view, uh, if not the only view within our own denomination. Uh, but there are those that uh, take a view of this book that it's little more than a story about love which is problematic for a number of reasons. I spoke on this a number of years ago, but it's problematic for a number of reasons, chiefly that our Savior taught that Christ is in all the Scriptures. And therefore, Christ is in the book of the Song of Solomon. And so, if he is not in it, in the love story, the question has to be asked, where is Christ in the book of Song of Solomon. I'm certainly convinced that this story points us to the love Christ has for his church. Now the bride in this love story was not a princess from a neighboring realm. Rather, the bride was actually an ordinary country girl. In chapter 1 verse 6, she says, Look not upon me, because I am blind because the sun hath looked upon me. And so she is a girl out in the country. She is used to looking after sheep. And the such then has been tanned by the sun. And uh, the king then, he comes in a most unexpected way. 
and he woos this young girl to himself. He is the king of glory, yet he stoops to woo this unworthy young woman, we could say. And of course, it pictures a greater love story. But Christ is the, the great king of glory. And he woos an unworthy bride. For every one of us are unworthy to be in that number of the bride of Jesus Christ, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have in chapter 3 then this royal procession. And it's making its way to the city of Jerusalem in preparation for the royal wedding. When we come into chapter 4 verse 8 we have the word spouse. And that word continues six times it's used in the latter part of chapter 4 and into chapter 5. And so this wedding then does take place. She becomes the spouse. Now in the journey then, uh, we have this procession being described. Verse 6, who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke perfumed with mare? and frankincense verse 7 behold his bed which is solomon's and it's a by the way statement but some would take solomon right out of this story and right out of this book and yet and while some would do that the book itself shows the folly of it because it speaks so clearly here of solomon in this particular chapter then verse 9 king solomon made himself chariot. I believe that the bed and the chariot are most likely one and the same thing here. Now, this is not a chariot that is drawn by horses. It is rather a palanquin. And if you're like me, not familiar with that word palanquin, if you're not familiar with the word, I think if I could explain it properly, you'll have seen something like this. So it was something like a bed and it was borne on four pillars on the, the corners and so men then would carry this bed and it's described here as a chariot because it was more than a chariot there was a canopy here a purple canopy the base of it the base of this palanquin was made of gold there was a floor covered with embroidered work and so there's all this work and effort that had gone in to make the journey comfortable as well as glorious as we read of this wording of silver and gold and uh, this embroidered fabric. So Solomon and his bride, they were relaxing in this palm as it made its way through the obscurity of the wilderness, making its way to Jerusalem. What is the picture here? I believe this cortege, as it were, speaks to us of how the Lord's people are being transported to glory. We are being transported to that great marriage supper of the Lamb, that great feast above. And we are being carried through this earthly wilderness with all of its dangers, with all of its trials, but we're being safely carried through. And remember, Solomon, despite his failures, is a picture in Scripture of Christ. He's a type of Christ. He speaks of Christ in his case. The name Solomon, being drawn from that same word that I mentioned this morning, Shalom, Shalom. And so Solomon is the one of peace. The prosperity of Solomon, as is described, reminds us of the great riches of Christ's grace and long suffering and so on. The wisdom, the prudence of Solomon points us to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is our heavenly Solomon. We are being transported as it were with him to the new Jerusalem. And so I've entitled the message then, The Royal Procession to Glory. 
the royal procession to glory. I want to see first of all the perfume of the prophet uh, the, of the procession. The perfume of the procession. If you look with me at verse six. Who is this that come out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? In royal processions in London, the emphasis so often is upon all of the sights and sounds, upon all of the pageantry, the majestic music, the beautiful clothing that those that are taking part in those parades wear for the ladies in the royal family, the wearing of expensive jewellery. And in Bible times, in processions, there certainly would have been an emphasis upon music and upon dress. We have not even described here. But there would also have been this emphasis upon aroma. And so, as this procession was making its way through the wilderness, it was not only something wonderful to behold with the eye, but there was something wonderful about this fragrance that accompanied the, the procession that was taking place. And the, the, the fragrance was more than the fragrance of flowers. And we see that there in that verse 6 where it talks about the pillars of smoke. And the, the lamps here were not merely to provide light at night. Of course, torches of fire would provide light at night. But verse 6 makes it clear that it's more than that. Perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchant. And so there were these fragrant, fragrant powders applied to the flame in order that there might be this beautiful fragrance that accompanied this royal procession. And it's interesting that the two fragrances that are mentioned in particular here, mare and frankincense, are those that we think of in relation to the wise men visiting our Lord Jesus after his birth. Remember how they brought the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense, as the name itself suggests, is pure incense. The vast majority of times that we read of this frankincense in the Old Testament has to do with worship. And so the frankincense was used in the worship of the Lord in the tabernacle and then the temple. And it is associated with prayer and with praise. Mer was used more for cosmetic purposes. It was used for perfuming beds and garments. It was mingled with wine. And it was also uh, it was mingled with wine for an anesthetic. But it was also used for burial. And Hendrickson, in his commentaries, he speaks of the frankincense speaking of our Lord's dead. The frankincense pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. The mayor is speaking of our Lord's suffering humanity. And so as you think of the idea of frankincense, this pure incense and its association with rising up before the father as this incense was seen to ascend it reminds us of our lord's perfection and of course our lord's perfection reminds us of our lord's deity and the mirrors have said then it speaks to us of our lord's sufferings it speaks of his sufferings in his humanity. And yet there was rising up from all our Lord's sufferings. The sufferings of the one who is God manifest in flesh. There was rising up from him that beautiful aroma. Remember how that is stated for us so clearly in Ephesians 5 verse 2. Walk in love 
As Christ have also loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. A sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. A beautiful aroma. Of course, the enemies of Christ, they didn't see anything attractive in the cross other than they rejoiced to see the one that they opposed to crucified. Our Lord's disciples at the time may not have seen anything beautiful about the cross. The Father smelt a beautiful aroma, a beautiful fragrance. Christ's sacrifice ascended them as this sweet smelling savour. It speaks of how the work of Christ was received by the Father. The Father accepted the work of the Son in the sinner's place, and thereby our acceptance is grounded in the acceptance of what Christ offered. As the Father was well pleased with the work of the Son, so we are received. And of course, we benefit not only from the, the sacrifice of Christ, but as our priest, he continues to pray for us. Remember, the priest would go into the holy place as he would pray. It would be the incense upon the altar of incense. It would be that beautiful smell. And so Christ, he prays for his people today. He intercedes for us and there is that beautiful smell then that beautiful aroma of glory but does not also speak of our duties in our earthly pilgrimage so there is this beautiful aroma the aroma of christ and his work but if you could turn with me to second corinthians chapter 2 and we read of another parade here another procession 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll read from the verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2 and the verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour, this fragrance, the aroma of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet Savor the sweet fragrance of Christ. And them that are saved and them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? And Paul is taking the image here of a military parade. And it's a military parade that is rejoicing in victory. Christ, of course, he is the, the great victor. He is the triumphant one. But it says here, he always causes us to triumph in Christ. We are to triumph. We are to overcome. He always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savour of his knowledge by us. And so the Lord is dispersing this fragrance, as it were, through our ministry. And the words do have a very special reference to the minister of the gospel here, and yet it does relate to the whole company of the Lord's people. To some, we are the savour of life unto life, that the Lord will use our life and witness to draw souls to the Lord for the building up of the Lord's people, for the advance of the Lord's kingdom. Sadly, there are others who are hardened. There's a savour of death unto death. But always the savour of Jesus Christ. And may it ever be our desire that we would be dispersing the beautiful fragrance of our Saviour. May our witness not be, as Jacob approved his sons, a stench, 
the world around us. May we be dispersing that beautiful smell of the cross of Christ and recognizing that as we testify of the cross of Christ, there's an offense in it. Therefore, death unto them. The perfume of the procession. I want to see then, secondly, the protection of the procession. The protection of the procession. Verse 7. It says, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score, that sixty valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel. We read of David that David had thirty mighty men, but here Solomon is said to have sixty valiant men. And, and these sixty valiant men then, they surround this palanquin as it is journeying through the the wilderness, it says of them, they all hold swords, verse 8, being expert in war, every man hath his sword upon his thigh. And so, if you think of the couple that are being transported, they feel, and rightly so, they feel protected, they feel secure. They are traveling through the wilderness, and yet they have these men protecting them. The Spurgeon said, Arabs crowd around. Wandering Bedouins were always prepared to fall upon the caravan. But these two didn't need to be worried about the Bedouins. They were protected. They were securely, even as they travelled through the wilderness. And we need to get the picture then for ourselves. God's people, the bride, we are being transported to glory. But we're in the royal carriages of where. Why there are those that would seek to rob us of all that we have in Christ? Why the devil, the great enemy, would seek to take from us the world? would deny our position. Yet none can succeed in taking the bride of Christ. The bride is secure. The bride is protected. We are, to use this language, surrounded by the three score valiant men. I believe they're speaking to us of the ministering spirits to the church of Christ. There was much nonsense said about angels and their ministry to the people of God. You may have heard that uh, children's poem, Four Corners to My Bed. Four angels there are spread, one at the head, one at the feet, and two to guard me while I sleep. Uh, it might sound nice, but there's nothing biblical about those words. In fact, the reality is something infinitely superior. The Lord does not limit our protection to four guardian angels. If you turn with me, please, to the Psalm 91. The Psalm 91. And we will come to look at this in coming weeks in association with the temptations of our Lord. We look at this in the morning meetings. But Psalm 91 verse 11, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. And the whole angelic company then has an interest in the protection of the Lord's people. Now this does not mean, of course, that we will never suffer any physical injury. But it does mean we will never suffer any physical injury outside the plan and purpose of God. Nothing can touch us unless the Lord permit it. And remember the whole context of this psalm, the opening words, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And this couple then, they did not need to be afraid by night. They did not need to be afraid in the day. There was this protection. And what a protection then there is upon the saints of the Lord today. As Satan certainly attacks. But yet, what a comfort. The Lord surrounds his people. His holy angels are there to protect us again. Before we move on, see those words in the verse 7. They're valiant men. Then verse 8, they all hold swords being expert in war. So we are surrounded because it speaks in verse 7 of how these valiant men are about it. We're surrounded but they are skillful. They're expert in war. They carry swords. They're set for battle. The swords upon them die. They're always in a state of readiness. Let us rejoice then in them. The Lord's people are a protected people. The Lord bride is a protected bride. The perfume of the procession, the protection of the procession. I want to see the pledge in the, in the procession. The pledge in the procession. For if you look at the uh, description in the chariot, of the chariot. It's certainly made of the choicest of materials, isn't it? In verse 10, he made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Now, if this palanquin was parked outside the palace of Solomon, it wouldn't look out of place. And so the Stagecoach of the Queen and all of those vehicles, they don't look out of place at Buckingham Palace, sure they don't. In contrast, if you think of this palanquin moving through the wilderness, it didn't quite fit the environment, just as some of those vehicles were parked outside your home or mine. It may look slightly out of place. And so this chariot, this bed, is a testimony of the wealth of Solomon. But why did Solomon not transport his bride in something that was cheap and functional? Why did he not have her carried on just some cheap construction of wood. And then when they got near Jerusalem, she could get into this panicking that she is being received into the city. But surely there's something very important for us to see here. That the bride, even in the wilderness, was to have a foretaste of what lay before her. And of course, what she would have in Jerusalem was greater than the palace. The palace would be greater than this. And yet she was being given this little foretaste of all that lay before. And surely it pictures then that as the Lord transports us today, the Lord does not transport us in a cheap box but we are surrounded by testimonies of the greatness of what the Lord has before us. The Lord gives us a taste of heaven while we are on earth. Now, of course, we cannot contemplate the, the full greatness of heaven. There are things beyond our full comprehension. And so in that sense, we're like the bride. We're looking at the splendor and 
we can't fully anticipate what it would be like to come to a promise. And yet the Lord does give to us little foretastes. Isn't that what the sealing of the Spirit is about? Second Corinthians 1 22, who also who have also seen thus and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And when the Lord saved you, he stamped you with his royal seal. The Holy Spirit was put in you. And there's that deposit, as it were. The guarantee, I will bring you the whole way to glory. And remember what Paul said, the Holy Spirit is witnessing to our spirit that we are the sons of God. We are in this palanquine as it were, and the Holy Spirit is testifying. You are the Lord's children, or to use the language of this passage, you're the Lord's bride. I'm bringing you home. You think about all the great promises of God, are they not like this palanquine in all of its splendor? Think of that great promise, Isaiah 38, verse 17. Thou hast cast all thy sins behind thy back. All thy sins behind thy back. Isn't that amazing? The Lord tells us right now, all of our sins, they're gone. They're no longer legally held against us. It's a foretaste of glory. The Lord speaks to us of the imputation of his righteousness. He tells us, you're dressed in the righteousness of the Son. Jehovah said, can you, the Lord is my righteousness. I think all of the comforts that the Lord gives us in his word, those times that we're troubled, we open up, God, open up God's word and we're so comforted through it. And the Lord gives us little foretastes of heaven. Yeah, I trust even in our worship services as we come together as the Lord's people, we ought to be little seasons of heaven and earth. As we join with the saints of God in the living worship, we're pointing forward to what we will be doing for all eternity. Have you ever spoken to unconverted people about what we'll be doing in heaven? And the unconverted, the very strange thoughts about what heaven is like. I'm sure, have you ever spoken to the unconverted that heaven's the place of everlasting worship? We'll be completely taken up with Jesus Christ. Doesn't sound attractive to you. Their idea of heaven is something rather different. The most blessed seasons for the Lord's people are to be those times of worship, public and personal. The Lord gives us here little foretastes of glory. You think of those beautiful words there in verse 10, where it says, He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, the midst thereof the engraved with love. Engraved with love. I don't know exactly what that means, but surely it does mean that the lady, as she looked there, Whatever the floor covering was, she could see in it a testimony of the love of the king. It's a bit like Song of Solomon 2, verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me is love. Here she sits in this carriage, as it were. And she's surrounded by evidences of love, evidence of royalty, the covering of purple, the bottom. It is of gold, again, so often speaking to us of data. The Lord's promises are guaranteed on account of who he is. 
The hymn writer said, oh, if there's only one song I can sing. When in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song through eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. We don't have to wait till we get to glory to sing that song. We even sing this evening, what a wonder that the Lord would love me. What a wonder that in this wilderness, as we walk through the valley of tears, as we're surrounded by troubles, that it is this pledge I bring you to safety. The whole way home, I bring you to something. May the Lord take his word to me and bless it to our hearts. We're going to turn in closing, please, to the words of the words of the hymn 310.
And oh Lord, we do rejoice that though we travel through a wilderness experience, that the Lord will bring us to that great palace above. Keep our eyes upon thyself, we pray. Oh Lord, we pray that we will continually look to our King and see all of his love that is demonstrated toward us. And we thank of those in our families, those all around us here that are so far from thee, that are so disinterested in the things of the King. Oh Lord, we pray that their eyes would be opened. Oh Lord, we pray that they would be brought to our Lord Jesus Christ, that they would run to Christ and be saved. Bless us through this incoming week, we pray. May we each be enabled to serve thee in a dark day. And may we testify well of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.